Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Bible in Order Faith Friday Special Edition here with Pastor Dean Odell. He's the founding pastor of Fire and Grace Church and Fire and Grace School of Ministry in Opelika, Alabama. He and his wife, Nancy, live in South Central Alabama with their teenage daughter and three dogs. Pastor Dean has been in the ministry for 36 years and has authored four books. Pastor Dean has ministered in the United States, Africa, the Middle East, and the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. Pastor Dean, thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you for having me. Sure appreciate it. It's, it is truly an honor. I've been following you for a little while now, and um, you 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 have some some different views from a lot of mainstream people, which is good. I think Jesus did as well. Uh, I reached out to your wife and asked, well, through your Facebook page, and said, "Hey, I'd, I'd really like to interview uh, this gentleman," and. Um, and I, I, I may have said something about flat earth and I was not, I wouldn't say I was corrected, but the response was pastor Dean would love to talk about biblical cosmology. Can you tell me what that is? Right. Well, biblical cosmology, I have no problem with people saying flat earth, but it's not just the shape of the earth. When you talk about cosmology, cosmology means the whole nature of creation from the sun, moon, and stars, that what is the firmament, uh, where is heaven? What is God's throne and his footstool? What is, where is hell? Where is paradise? Uh, so what is, you know, above the earth? What is beneath the earth? So it's, it's, it's a, a much broader issue than just the shape of the earth. And yes, incorporated in that is the, the earth is a flat uh, plane with contour, but primarily flat, which is provable easily by mathematics and long distance uh, photography and telescopes and things. I mean, we can talk about all that in a minute, but the biblical side of it, because there's a lot of people that are just into, and even unsaved secular people are into, you know, they've, they've looked at the evidence and saying, yeah, okay, the earth is flat, but they don't really understand, you know, from the biblical perspective, uh, what that looks like about heaven, about hell beneath, about how really the sun, moon, and stars operate. And the scriptures are just full of that. And what the ends of the earth is what the Bible says about it, the, the limits of our habitation and all that. So when you, I use, I like using the term either biblical earth or biblical cosmology. I don't, I'm not, I don't shy away from flat earth, but that's like saying it's just part of it. Mm -hmm. it's like, like if you're talking about the car and you're just talking about, you know, the engine, but there's a lot more to the car, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I always usually say biblical cosmology, AKA flat earth, you know, okay, and go from there. Well, uh, where where did this come from for you? I mean, because certainly that's not something taught in public school, you know. Um, it, right. At what point did you start to see things from a different perspective and and start digging into that? Well, you know, I'll, I came back to the Lord when I was nineteen years old, so that was nineteen eighty seven. So, um, and I started studying the Bible and really, you know, God called me to the ministry and I had a powerful encounter with Jesus and uh, open vision and called me to the preach his word and teach his word. And he always told me, he said, I'm going to teach you things that not all would expect, but they will be the things uh, for me. And they're going to, they're going to set the captives free. So, uh, and, and God would always confirm that through other people at other prophets come tell me, you're going to, you're going to teach things that, that, the church is not really wants to touch with a 10 foot pole, but you have to. So I always knew I was going to have a, a ministry that would teach things that a lot of churches would ignore. And um, so I've, I've been fine with that. And over the years that's happened, whether it be confronting eternal security, false doctrine, what I call once they've always saved no matter how you live and confronting that, or can Christians have demons and need deliverance? And I mean, we could just go on down the list. I've been uh, a controversial to the mainstream church world, I've been a controversial minister for a long time, but I would read the Bible over the years, even in my 20s and 30s, and I would read the Bible, and especially whenever I read Joshua 10, because I'm, I'm one that's always believed the Bible from cover to cover, that mm -hmm. it's the inspired, infallible word of Almighty God. And so I trust it from Genesis to Revelation to be God's word and the truth. Mm -hmm. And... um so when I would read Joshua 10, where Joshua was fighting the Amalekites and, you know, the battle was going long and he, he, he needed this, the, the day to stay there. So he says he commanded the sun and the moon to stand still. And I would read that and go, I know Joshua was on the mountain with God, with Moses. Um, 
For instance, Joshua may have been there when God gave it to Moses and gave stuff in revelation to Moses. If not, Moses told him directly, this is what God said about creation. I believe Joshua knew is knew the truth. So, you know, to say, you either have to say that the earth was still and the sun and the moon move in a circuit over us, which is exactly what the Bible teaches in other places, or you have to say the earth stopped spinning. And that's just not... That's just not the context. Set. In fact, the, the Joshua 10, he says that the moon stood still over this area and the sun over this area. And so specific areas of the earth that the moon, sun and the moon were over. And I was like, wow, that, that used to bother me. And I used to say to the Lord, I'd say, I don't understand this because I believe you. But my brain could not at the time because I've been so indoctrinated from childhood that it was a certain way that I, I couldn't even con get a concept of what it might be or what God might be saying. But I think because over the years, I've always cried out to, for God to and his Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me into all truth. And that, Lord, show me what I don't see. Teach me what I don't know. I never believe I know everything or I see everything. And I've always prayed that prayer. And I think because he knew I wanted the truth, um, he, he, he brought it to me. A friend of mine uh, sent me a video in 20, October 2015. He sent me a video that, uh, and, and, and he was asking the question and I didn't even know what he was asking. He said, does, does firmament earth ring a bell? Now this is this guy I was, I grew up with, but I was kind of discipling him from a distance. I said, firmament earth. I've never even heard those two frames put together. You know, those two words put together like that phrases. I said, and so he sent me like this 20 minute video and I'm like, okay, so I can't, I was busy, but I was like, I can't even answer Sam if I don't watch this video. Cause I don't even know what he's asking. Right. So the video didn't say anything about flat earth. But the Lord had warned me about two months before he'd said, I got something else to show you and it's big. So I knew there was something coming, but I didn't know what it was. And the first part of the video just dealt with a lot of NASA fakery. Well, I, I already knew that I didn't believe the moon landings from a child. You know, mm. I, I mean, I just knew it instinctively. And then I watched Capricorn one as a kid. And I'm like, that's exactly what they did. And so I'm like, but when I started seeing like just fake footage, from the ISS and all this other stuff. And it just kind of laid out. I was like, and, it, 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 and, and before it even got into the biblical cosmology side of it, immediately the Holy Spirit came on me. It was like, I knew, I said, oh my God, I know exactly what they're about to say and while I'm watching this. And sure enough, he go, it showed a, the first image of like the high altitude balloon footage, 100, it's at 120,000 feet. And I'm like, Oh gosh, there ain't no curve there, you know. And I, and then I, so I watched the the whole. I'm watching that whole thing, and I'm just like, oh, that. And then the second half of the video, and this guy was a Christian that did the video. He gets into the scriptures about, it. and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. And I'm pull out my Greek and Hebrew lexicons, and I'm pulling out the Bible, and I start saying, I'm like, by the end of it, once I, once the video went off, and I spent the next few hours just going through the scriptures and looking up the Hebrew and Greek words. And going, it's here. It's always been here. It, w it was just an awakening to the to the what the Bible says, and that if the Bible says it, it's true. But the Bible also says in First Thessalonians five, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. So, um, you know, I spent a lot of time over the next month, like I I couldn't sleep because I just was trying to. I was researching and digging into the scriptures and the the evidence out there. And then finally uh, bought a P Nikon P900 and went down to Mobile Bay and tested it for myself. And uh, sure enough, uh, we've we've done multiple tests with lasers, high zoom cameras like the Nikon P900. We've had the Nikon P1000. We've used telescopes across there. Uh, I have so many photographs and videos. Uh, there's no curve. I mean, I mean, for instance, like one of the times we went, if you, we, we would go down to Fairhope, Alabama. So if you, if you look at, for those not familiar with Alabama, if you look at the bottom of Alabama, our little panhandle, there's a little, there's a little U down there and Mobile Bay comes in right there. And so you can go on the east side. There's a place called Fairhope, Alabama. It's got a little nice little beach and park there. And we would go there and shoot across to Mobile. Well, depending on the angle, if you shoot north northwest, you're talking about 14 to 15 miles to downtown Mobile. Due west, straight across is 11 miles. To I-10 Bridge is 10 miles, 
uh, to the USS Alabama Battleship Park is about 12 and a half. So we were shooting these distances. And for instance, if you shoot straight west uh, from Fairhope, Alabama on the beach with the P900, I can zoom in at 11 miles and see the, the, and I have video of this, not just pictures. And I did it all day long. So can, uh, changing conditions and temperatures and everything. But you can see the, the blue spools sitting on the dock. All right. Now, what most people don't know is they don't understand the, the curvature rate of the Earth. If the Earth's a sphere of 24,901 miles, then it's the, on average, the curving away from you minimum is going to be eight inches per mile squared. All right. So at 10 miles, that equals 66.6 feet of Earth curve, meaning that's how high the point of the bulge is supposed to be blocking your view from what's on the other side. So we're talking about for 11 miles, it gets up to 75 feet. So we're talking about a seven story building. I shouldn't be able to see anything unless it was higher than a seven story building on the other side of Mobile Bay. I can see the spools, the, the dock, according to Google Earth, sits 10 feet off the water. The spools are, some of them are 12 feet high, some are 16 feet high. And I can see them. I can see houses that are built on the bottom near the water from across there. Um, I can see government plaza building, which I should only be able to see at 14.6 miles, the government plaza building in downtown Mobile. I should only be able to see the top four floors. I can see all the way to the bottom floor. And I can't see the bottom floor perfectly. I see the second floor, but there's an on-ramp coming onto I-10 right there. I can see the on-ramp and watch the cars come in on I-10. The I-10 bridge going across Mobile Bay is not any higher, and I checked with Alabama Department of Transportation, it's 16 feet off the water. I should not be able to see the I-10 bridge anywhere. We can take binoculars and look at the I-10 bridge from 10 miles away and watch the cars going across it and see underneath it. If if the Earth's a sphere that they tell us, that should be impossible. Mm -hmm. I, last time we went, I took two um, PhDs in physics from a local university, and they saw it with their own eyes, and they were just blown away. So what would and, you say uh, to somebody who uh, who says, okay, so maybe the Earth is just a whole lot bigger or a different shape than than what NASA tells us? You know, maybe it's not this, you know, maybe maybe the circumference of the Earth is a well, lot more than 26,000 miles or, or whatever they say it is. Well, then that's going to mess up all kinds of stuff for them, like the, all their flights and navigation and uh GPS, it would change everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it would change distances. So you you would just, you you would have to go, okay, well, uh, then there's a whole lot of things that's wrong. Mm -hmm. A lot of things, you know. I mean, it's either the size, because you can, with, with whether you have a sphere or you have a flat disc type situation, math is kind of the same dealing with a circle versus a, a ball. You can, you you know, there's similarities. Uh, but if you start stretching it out really way bigger than it is, or it's a different shape, uh, then we got a whole lot of lies going on. We got a, and a whole lot of deception and a whole lot of things we, it, you just have to look at and go, wow. But you know, every picture they, every, every picture or image they give us from space, it's a perfect sphere. Um, you know, everyone across the board agrees on the, basic 24,901 miles. And so you, you could only have, you know, like even Einstein said that whether you look at the earth as a stationary plane geocentric, or you look at it as a heliocentric, he said, the math still works. You just have to change a few little, few little things he said, but it still works. So I just, you know, of course, Neil deGrasse Tyson says it's, an oblate spheroid that it's pear shaped and all this other nonsense, but we never seen a picture of a pear shaped earth or an oblate spheroid. And, and I think they do that. They say that, that it's oblate, that it's kind of flattened out a little bit because they're trying to, they're trying damage control, spin control, because people are finding these flat areas all over the earth. I, I will you say know, you, you got to want, you got to, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I remember being in the fifth grade in public school in San Diego, California, when I was taught that we're like spinning at a thousand miles an hour or whatever. And, and just in my 10 year old brain thinking I should be able to jump up in the air and land 
like three feet over or maybe six inches over, but something like, why am I coming straight down? So, it, it, and when I, for me, I, I didn't know people still thought that there was a flat earth or, you know, biblical cosmology. It, it never even occurred to me until one night I couldn't sleep probably four or five years ago. It was about five years ago. I watched that, um, Amazon mockumentary, I think on, uh, beyond, beyond the sphere, beyond the curve, something like that. And, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I brought it up at a business networking meeting the next morning. I said, man, you know, people are, I didn't know that they're still flat earth. Like, you know, did, had you guys heard this? And, um, one guy came out and said he was absolutely, he's a diehard flat earther. He, he, he went in on he, 20 minutes of, of schooling, schooling the crowd and people were getting mad and walking out. And I was like, if demons are manifesting over this, there must be something to it. There's just gotta be, why, why is it such a hot button issue for people? Do you think? Well, I'll, I'll tell you because, and this was the awakening. You know, w once we did those things, once I once I saw it in the scriptures, once I saw the evidence and started looking at high altitude footage and stuff, and then did our own test multiple times, you know, and all this, and and then started going when I went public with it, and I had it's the same reaction to many people. Um, see, Satan has certain lies, certain deceptions. He has different ones for different people, right? For different purposes. And you guys just have to remember Satan and his whole kingdom, all the demons and fallen angels and everything, they have, their agenda is to deceive and turn as many people away from believing the Bible, finding Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That's his goal, turn as many people away from that. Because then he turns the world wicked, he, he can bring forth his plan, and he's, he's like a mafia boss. He wants to, he, he knows he's not going to win in the end. But he's willing, he hates God so much and that he wants to hurt as many of us as he possibly can and steal as many of us away from him and lead us into hell for eternity. So he he's just a crazy psychopathic, you know, but 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 very smart deceiver. And so the apostle Paul talks about in Romans one that that because of creation, man is without excuse. Right. And and it is the greatest witness to the the unsaved that there is a creator and that the Bible is true because the Bible gives specific details about creation. It talks about the sun and the moon being inside the firmament, being smaller, being closer, moving in a circuit over us. Uh, the earth being flat, still in at rest and immovable. You know, so what happened was Satan came along going, well, it, the greatest witness to bring somebody to believe in, a, in there is a God. And then to the Bible, because the Bible has details about creation, and to believe that and then to find Jesus as their Lord and Savior, right? If creation will do that, then I have to come up with an alternative view. Just like he's had to come up with an alternative view for the origin of mankind. We can't have man creating Adam and Eve and beginning the human race. We have to have them evolving out of the primordial soup and then, you know, coming, eventually evolving from, from monkeys. I mean, they have to have an alternative message to pull people away to believe that or people who want to believe that. So um, I say this, I, I've seen debates between atheists and Christians and atheists will say you cannot you, you cannot be a Christian because you cannot believe Genesis one. Because we have proven it to be false and not the way it is. And it's, and it's just, again, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about what Jesus said about the stars falling he said if you say that you have no idea what those things are but that's jesus said the stars will fall from heaven when he returns all of them will fall to the earth so they must be smaller and closer and different than what we've been told and of course that's being most flat earthers and biblical cosmology people who've studied and researched this and started shooting zooming in on the stars and 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 looking at the sun and the moon and the movement and everything that's what people are figuring out but it's just one of Satan's big lies to lead people away from God Almighty of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so that's why my book, in my book that I wrote, Like Clay Under the Seal, I dedicate an entire chapter to all the atheists and agnostics that have come to Jesus that have sent me messages 
and some of my friends' messages over the, you know, I wrote the book in 2019. So at that time, it would have been just over a four year mm-hmm. period. And I, I have testimony after testimony after testimony of atheists that said, I didn't believe the Bible because, because I believe this world's heliocentric science view of creation. So the Bible couldn't be true. And then what's happened, they stumbled on some stuff and started looking at the evidence and finding out, yeah, it's flat and still and at rest and, and NASA lies about everything. They started finding that out and then they go, wait a minute. Then they run across me or somebody like me that says, you know, the Bible said this all along. This is what the Bible taught. And then they come and look at the Bible. Well, the Bible's true. I have people say the moment they realized that they just started in tears and gave their lives to Jesus. We're talking about hardcore atheists. I mean, I just won Paul from Sweden, six foot seven Paul from Sweden, grew up in an atheist home his whole life, went to college, mechanical engineer, brilliant guy, right? He he contacts us in 2017 and says, tells me his whole story of how, you know, God began to open his eyes about what was really going on in the world. He didn't know it was God at the time, but he was like about money and the new world mm-hmm. order and this and that. And he starts, so he starts digging in and he said, I saw a video about flat earth. He said, I just laughed it off. Like, yeah, that's crazy. He said, but something kept nagging him. Like, well, you've looked into other things that you used to scoff. So, you know, he said, finally he watched it and, and it was, a, yeah, it was probably one of the more secular flat earth, you know, uh, videos because he said he just he he looked at that and he started seeing the evidence and it made sense to him and the math he he understood the math of the curvature rates and all that and so he said finally one day he goes I didn't even want to hear Christians he said but finally one day he said I watched uh, uh, I just I and I don't know if it was me or somebody else but he watched kind of a an outline of people going through here's what the scripture says about creation and. He's like, my God, the Bible said this all along. It must be right. And he started reading the Bible. Next thing you know, he he gives his life to Jesus. He's born again. He starts searching for a church in Sweden. He said, there's hardly, he said, there's, I pretty much cannot find a church in Sweden that believes the Bible anymore. He said, can I, can I come to your church from Sweden and will you baptize me? Wow. So he, he took a plane from Sweden to Alabama, you know, for me to baptize him in water. And, uh, wow. And, and and his testimony is in my book, and and he, you know, I we we still chat and talk, and he's still walking with the Lord, man. And I mean, that's just one of many hardcore atheists that once they've seen the the physical evidence and then see what the Bible says that it said it all along. I've never seen in thirty six years of ministry one biblical truth, or and I call it an apologetic tool to break down a false belief and a, a satanic lie. I've never seen any apologetic truth bring more atheists to Jesus than hmm. this topic of biblical cosmology. Are, are you, would you describe it? I mean, I, I don't, I don't mean this in a demeaning way at all. Like I, I, I don't have the language, but would you say that the earth is like, like we are in a giant snow globe where God's throne is at the, at the top of it? Okay. Yes. That's a good way. I mean, that's a good, simple, you know, example of what it looks like. More like a, a terrarium type situation. Mm-hmm. The Bible talks about the firmament. And this is probably for Christians. This is one of the biggest issues because I can tell you this. Most Christians do not know what the firmament is and they've never studied it. And then there's creation ministries that completely get it wrong about what the firmament is because the Bible systematically tells us what it is. And even the the early Jewish Pharisee historian Josephus tells you exactly what the Jews believed and and ancient he what's what's called ancient Hebrew cosmology, but they did believe, and you find it in Job, uh, Ezekiel talks about it, and then of course John does in Revelation. But it's a crystalline molten glass structure that's over the earth that the stars are attached to. And that God's throne sits upon his sapphire throne. And actually, the color of that molten glass, from what we can tell from Scripture, is sapphire or blue, which is why the sky appears to be a blue color. But it's also transparent, kind of transparent, translucent thing. God actually lets his glory shine through it at times. And um, but that is what we're that's what's described. If For instance, Ezekiel chapter one. He literally says, I saw the firmament and he called it, it had the appearance of 
he called it the terrible crystal, which means just amazing, just awe inspiring. So he sees the firmament. He said, I saw the firmament and then I saw the throne upon the firmament and one and a man mm -hmm. sitting upon it. And the throne was like mm -hmm. sapphire. And that's where God talks about. He's like, heaven is my throne, right? Earth is my footstool. But what is that firmament is what's Bible calls the second heaven, right? See, the first heaven, there's three heavens. Paul said when he went to, God took him up to heaven and he saw unspeakable things that a man's not allowed to utter. He said that, that he was at to the third heaven. So the first heaven is our atmosphere. It's, it's, it's what's created by the dome underneath it, where the birds fly and the air and where we breathe. That's heaven number one. The solid firmament, crystalline, molten glass dome is also called heaven. And it is the second heaven. And then the third heaven is above that. And that is the, th that is the heaven we know as God's throne and that where the angels are and where the mansions are and all this okay. stuff, right? So um, that's the three tier, you know, that's the three heavens. And, and, and so, and then you go, you, you see in Revelation, you see Revelation 15, you see them, it says they're standing on the sea of glass before the throne mm -hmm. of God with harps in their hands. And, and it said it was, it was mingled with fire. And if you go look and watch how they make glass, it's mingled with, it's, it's sand mingled with fire until it becomes this molten glass structure. So, if, and if you think about it, there's a guy, I can't remember, I've got the, the somewhere, a guy that did it, built a terrarium, you know, kind of about this big. I mean, bigger than, you know, you could sit it in your a room of your house or whatever, but he built this terrarium like in the 70s and has never opened it. He put the dirt in there. He put some stuff, he, you know, put, poured a little water in there, sealed it up, and it it keeps everything alive perfectly. Mm -hmm. And that's what's interesting because Josephus, that first century historian, he said he fitted it uh, for the, the the giving of rain and dew. And, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, that's what, again, that's what the, the, the scriptures describe in a nutshell. And that God's throne is up there. And then below the earth, there is a place called paradise with a great gulf between it. And then going deeper is hell, Sheol, Tartarus, uh, the place where, you know, God said he made for the devil and his angels, but people who follow them, they're going to end up there. And so that's, that's the Hebrew cosmology or the biblical cosmology is just explaining that whole and system. But see, it makes sense. Th does your book what, go into all, all of that? Oh yeah. Okay. I have, I have an entire book that explains what the firmament is and systematically goes through the scriptures. And uh, amazingly, like most lexicons will say the Hebrews considered the firmament a molten glass dome that's why some some translations of the bible like the complete jewish mm -hmm. bible translates that do mm -hmm. dome they'll literally say the dome is over the earth and what's amazing is how the elites the satanic elites that are in the media and entertainment and all this stuff keep putting stuff like this in their movies because they have to tell the truth about it and they put the truth out there all the time. Uh, Stephen King's thing, the dome. And they did a TV series, the dome. And it's this glass dome over everything. I mean, over and over again, they're showing you they know the truth. And I, th I believe that our government discovered it in the 1960s with Operation. They had Operation Dominic. And under uh, within the Operation Dominic, there was an operation they called Fishbowl. Now think about it. So Operation Dominic, which means Dominic means of the Lord, fishbowl. So a fishbowl of the Lord, right? They shot a Thor missile as high as they could shoot it, uh, which is a, was a nuclear missile, and detonated it at the highest altitude they could because they wanted to see if they could crack open the firm. I kid you not. I'm like, what are they thinking if they succeeded? I'm like, what do they think it might come down here? I'm like, these are a bunch of idiots. But, of course, nothing's going to yeah. break it uh, of man. But they, I think they realized it in the 1940s and the 1950s. I think they discovered the, the, the firmament that comes down to the ends of the earth at Antarctica. I believe they discovered it with Operation so High Jump. For, for people Earth. listening who might not be familiar, Antarctica, you, you would suggest, is not just at the base of the planet, but actually an ice wall no. that, that circles the entire earth that is shaped like a pie more round with a with a dome over yeah. it okay right now let me say this at the outset we don't know how deep the earth is 
but we don't know how high the firmament is. There's two things God said, you will not know the earth for depth or the heaven for height. You will not know, okay? So we don't know exactly how high. We don't know how thick the earth is, right? The deepest hole ever dug, about seven miles. But what we do know is that being a circle, and it's called great circle navigation, the way they navigate across the world, but the circle like this, the outer edges of it or the ends of the earth is Antarctica. And yes, it is and most of Antarctica. And I have this from government, declassified government documents as well, not just not just hearsay or internet say. But most of the Antarctica ends in these high 200 foot ice, you know, just sheer cliffs coming off that are ice. Apart from that, let's say the ice wasn't there. The mountain range that goes all the way around Antarctica is the highest. They'll say Antarctica is the highest point on the earth. It's higher than than anything else, than Mount Everest or anything. So there's a mountain range there as well. So what God did was he said in Proverbs 8 that he 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 engraved a, a circle upon the face of the deep. So what he did was he made a circle. Then he says he created the boundary limits. So like we know with water, all water, water has to have a container, right? Or it just goes away and it finds wherever it's going to go. So you, water has, has to have a container. So the, the container for the, for the world, for the oceans, is that that goes all the way around. Um, and what's happened was Operation High Jump. The reason they called it High Jump is because they literally had to pull up to this ice wall. And then they had to lift everybody up there to get on it. And there's still ships today that will come right up against that wall. There's numerous pictures. And they have to lift people up to get up there. And it, 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 it's impressive, right? It's like, wow. And so they called it high jump because they had to jump high to get up on the shelf. And then, of course, the governments of the world, they're the only ones that really have the equipment and the finances um, and the experts to handle that level of cold and and explore that far and i believe they went and found uh see that's why a lot of people say well oh if if the if the earth is flat and then you're gonna fall off somebody can fall off the edge it's it doesn't work like that it's a container you actually will run into you if you can go far enough you will run into mm -hmm. not you'll, you'll you'll get to the ice wall first and we don't know how far it could be a thousand miles it could be two thousand miles i don't know how we don't know how far it is from the ice wall of antarctica to the firmament but there's been reports that they they found it, and that's what Admiral Byrd found, and that's what it was after that later on that they tried Operation Dominic and Fishbowl, right? And I think they were thinking that you know we've we're like rats in a cage or something. We got to get out of here. I've heard the rumor is they've tried to drill through where the firmament meets the Earth in Antarctica, and every time they drill a hole, it for, it fills back up like it's like mm, mm. back together. And the firmament may also have some type of foundation there. It may not be the glass they see, but they it may be like a foundation they're trying to drill through. And they, every time it just seals back up. And what's interesting, they talk about there's been this uh, they call the, the sky stone. And I've heard about people finding pieces of it uh, on the earth and, you know, or in markets and stuff. And they've tested this stuff. And I've heard the same thing about the, what they found in Antarctica when they drill through it. But basically, this this solid blue uh, type rock uh, is made up. Well, they said it's like ninety to ninety five percent oxygen, but it's a solid, which is the strangest thing. They, they even because I have an article they've they've tested mm -hmm. this thing and stuff. So uh, so there's definitely some some interesting things about Antarctica, and of course the Antarctic Treaty. Look, I've been looking into trying to go to Antarctica. I'm going to tell you right now. The paperwork you have to fill out, uh, you're only going to be allowed, from what I can find, you're only allowed to go to the outer little peninsula tip of it. There's a little peninsula that sticks out in Antarctica. You can find it. I can't remember what its name now, Shelton Island maybe or something like that. But it, it's a little peninsula. You can go there and do a little tour. I think there's one group where it lets you come to the inland, but basically just off the shore and camp. You're not going to be allowed because of the Antarctic Treaty and the governments of the world have a lot of have so strict environmental regulations and everything else. They are not going to allow you if you if you were a multi-billionaire and you wanted to go do your own private expedition, that is not mm. going to happen. I one guy tried to do it 
and got arrested and by the by the chile the navy picked him up right so um that's why they just they don't allow a lot there and and one of the reasons too is you could prove a lot because of uh, if the earth is the flat uh circle that we believe it is then the sun if you're in the south in antarctica the sun's going to come in like this and move away from you so come in move away right um so if you're in antarctica and you could sit there and watch a 24 hour day if the sun doesn't start say over here and go around you behind you and come around like this then you're not spinning on a bottom of a right. ball it's not happening and here's what's interesting they have flagpoles there that are casting shadows and they have webcams on them and the sun will come in and the, the the shadow will start and when it gets about here where the sun would be going away and show that the shadow doesn't go in a circle but it just pops back over here start over is coming in like this and going out like that they edit the footage and don't allow you to see hmm. and there's been people email them and say why do you edit the footage why don't you get oh it's too cold to let our cameras run 24 hours it's just baloney they give us so yeah antarctica i talk about the in the, my book a whole chapter about antarctica and and one of the key let me show you this is beautiful because the bible talks about the ends of the earth which means there's, you know, some of those terms, it depends on the, the scripture. Some of it is talking about just the people that are live in extreme parts of the earth. But there are places, there's different Hebrew words for ends of the earth. And part of that is it talks about the limit of where man can go, right? It is our boundary limit. And so, um, but there's one, is there's some neat things like the Bible talks about, he will cause the vapors to rise from the ends of the earth. Well, vapors are basically cloud, right? Cloud formations. They'll tell you, you go look any science website, the cloud formations come from Antarctica. Uh, he talks about the treasury of the winds, meaning the winds, the reason that uh, NASA launches all their balloon satellites from Antarctica is because the winds are the strongest there and they have the, the highest wind currents and the strongest wind currents to take those balloon satellites over the circle. And so they'll say it's the, the Antarctica is the windiest place on earth. Well, the Bible said it's the windiest place, right? Then he said it's the it's the place where the vapors rise also. Well, a lot of people don't know this. There's over a hundred volcanoes in Antarctica. People talk about global warming and climate change is why the ice is melting there. So, no, it has nothing to do with that. There's there's active volcanoes all the way around. Well, those active volcanoes actually cause the they, they mix with that cold air and everything, and they will cause clouds and vapor and create uh, clouds for rain that we need in the world. So all of it's important, but he talks about it. But one of the key things, Psalm 65, this was one of the neatest things I found as I was writing the book and right before we did Skyfall 2019. Isaiah 65 says that the ends of the earth is the place where the noise of the waves are stilled in silence, mm -hmm. right? They don't make the noise. You go to any beach, Waves are crashing in. Mm -hmm. It's loud. You go to Antarctica ice wall, no waves making any noise. You know why? Because what makes a wave? You've got a beach like this, water, you know, the pushing of the wind. And so as the water's moving in, it's losing depth. So it, it the, the bottom actually pushes the water up to make the wave, right? Well, Antarctica is just going straight down. And so... I, I I did a uh, when I 2019 uh, Skyfall 2019. I've got one Antarctica in the Bible, and I show the videos of them in like little uh, boats pulling up to this ice wall, and it's just like silent, just like no movement of the water. And one guy said, "It's this is the most eerie quiet I've ever heard in my mm -hmm. life." And I, I just show picture after picture, video after video of it's the place where the noise of the waves are right. still in silence. Well, I mean, these are details that could only be from God who made it, right? The, a, a Middle Eastern prophet couldn't write that, or King David write that. He'd never been there. Yeah. How could he know that about the ends yeah. of the earth? That's so interesting. Yeah. These, a lot of this are, these are things that I've never heard. I mean, I, I've, I've come to the realization that we're not on a spinning ball. Okay. But that's as far as I've gotten because 
you know, I don't have the money to go or the time to go to Antarctica or maybe the freedom to go to Antarctica and, and do these things. I, I have perceived when I, I mean, it's, it's easily observable when, when you look at water, when you, when you look at water in a glass, in a bathtub, on a lake, it's the, the surface is always flat. And so in my mind, Mm -hmm. an ocean is going to be flat unless proven otherwise that, you know, um, Mm -hmm. and so I'm I'm tracking with a lot of it. Some of, some of this is new to me. What would you say to people? Because I've, you know, I've, I've tried to get, you know, a lot of my friends say, you know, you've lost it on that one, Dodie. Like, you know, I had, you, you had me until flat earth, you know, and, um, what 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 would you say to people who say like we can see the international space station how how is that suspended in air if gravity is not a thing if we're if we're not you know if if, if explain satellites okay well here's the thing i got a whole chapter about satellites what they are and and the truth about them from declassified FOIA documents okay from the National Reconnaissance Office all the way to CIA, NASA, I know exactly what satellites are. All right, but let's let's just look at the the ISS for one second. All right, they say it's about a football field, you know, long. Right? Okay. So 100 yards. Um, not too far off, you know, a 747, maybe a tad bit smaller, right? But still has a wingspan and everything. All right, you'll see what what allegedly. I'm going to say allegedly is the ISS going across. And and if you can see that, all right, then we have an airplane go across. Now the airplane is flying at six miles high. The ISS allegedly is at 240 miles or 270. I can't remember now, but it's, it's over 200 and something miles high. And you're going to tell me that they're relatively the same size. One may be a tad bit bigger. But you're going to tell me that you're seeing that little plane looks like a dot at six miles. But you're going to tell me you're seeing the ISS at 240 to 270 miles. No, you're not. Okay. Now, what you are seeing, uh, NASA has multiple aircraft. They have the old uh, U-2 planes that they retrofit with some different things. They have the SR-71. They also have the X-37B which is a drone space shuttle type vehicle. The true military, I can, I'll just tell you this in a nutshell, because I've, I've, I've got the government documents, um, messages and all that break all this down. But bottom line, the military operations and purpose for NASA is not a space organization. It was a, to create recon vehicles air vehicles that would fly high as they could go and fast as they could go to fly over Russia, China, and other countries to spy on them. And we had to keep developing the, the ability to go higher and faster because of Russian and, you know, particularly Russian uh, anti-aircraft technology was just getting, always getting better and better and better. And this is what the, the classified documents are. But what sa- satellites, all satellites and from the beginning, the Echo One and Echo Two. If you go, if you go to NASA's website now, they will admit that the Echo One and Echo Two were had in the nose cone a Mylar balloon to deploy once they plowed into. I'll, I'll tell, talk about this in a minute. But the Ether at seventy three miles, they plow into that a little bit and they deploy a Mylar balloon, and and then a satellite comes out attached to that balloon, and then the current, the Ether current and or wind currents at times, depending on the altitude, carry those satellites in a circle over our flat earth. And this is in the government documents. Like I said, I got a whole chapter of going, I even got National Reconnaissance Office admitting the early Corona satellites, right? We had, we had, the, we had the Echo 1 and Echo 2, which was NASA's first experiments with this. And then they created the secretly the Corona satellite system, which we still use because much of the stuff is still redacted in there. But they admit they are on balloons. Now, you cannot put a Mylar balloon inflated with whatever, hydrogen, helium, whatever they want to inflate it with. You don't put that in a negative 17 tor vacuum of space. You, You put a balloon in a vacuum chamber and collapses. 
This is does this does not work. And what they try to tell us what outer space is is not what it is. And so they use these balloons because the balloons help the satellites maintain altitude for longer periods of time. That's why they've learned how to. Uh, that's why uh, Elon Musk came up with this whole um, mm-hmm. Starlink. It's just a bunch of balloons that they are now learning how to steer and keep up there longer uh, by deploying in like filling the balloons up more. But the National Reconnaissance Office admits their whole they had a whole thing, a whole operation of when these balloons began to deflate and the satellite began to drop back down, they had a plane that was designed to fly by and catch the satellite, hook the, the cable and pull it in before it could go to the ground and, and be found by someone else because it was taking pictures over Russia and China and everywhere else. So that's what they are. And what And let me explain space, okay? At, well, this is, the, this the, I figured out by studying. Real, real, real quick what, question. Um, are you saying that Elon Musk is a flat earther? Elon Musk knows what it is. He's okay. not going to tell you. Elon Musk is part of the satanic okay. cabal system. He's okay. not on our side. He's a game player. And uh, he tries to play both sides of the fence, but he is not for us, I assure you. Um, but he knows, they all know, the higher-ups, anybody that... You don't get to that level without... That, that can... Uh, no. Yeah. No, they know. And I mean, again, this is in this is in classified documents. Classified documents from... The Air Force, the Navy, the Army Research Laboratory, uh, CIA, NSA, National Recon. I have art, I have documents from all of them that admit we live on a non-rotating flat Earth. It's in the documents. It was classified. It's in documents where it was classified to the point that if you divulge the information in those documents, you committed treason and went to prison. Okay, I have these are these are because of the Freedom of Information Act. These are things that have been available to the public for years. You just have to take the time to go dig them up and pull them up. And um, I I have one document from 1961, which this is after the Echo 1 and Echo 2 was 58. So we have uh, NASA getting their first IBM computer systems. And they had NASA rocket scientists and computer science t- scientists programming their computers, and I quote, to track a missile in space based on a non-rotating flat Earth formula. Now, why would you ever, if, 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 if that's a fairy tale, why would NASA scientists be programming their computers to track a missile in space using a flat non-rotating Earth? I I could go. Th- I, we could take three hours. I could go through all government document stuff. Like it. it's okay. unbelievable. The information is there. They know it to be true. Wow. Hey, your listeners, right now, your listeners, do this. Google NASA document twelve oh seven. It's going to take you to NASA.gov. It's going to pull up a document from nineteen eighty seven called the, the derivation and definition of linear aircraft model. Read the introduction, and then read the conclusion. And it's going to tell you rigid aircraft of constant mass flying over a non-rotating flat earth. Derivation means the origin. Definition means how we define this. It's got all. It's talking about how aircraft fly over the earth, and uh, particularly mock aircraft fly over the earth. And it says they fl- it flies over. They fly over non-rotating flat earth. That's direct hmm. from NASA. That and then what they try to do though, they try to blow it off and go well. We just use flat earth equations and assumptions because it simplifies the math. Let me ask you a question. Aren't we supposed to have the brightest and the best, the MIT, the Cal Tech? We've got the Stanford. We've got the top rocket scientists, mathematicians in the world working at NASA. Who needs to simplify the math? If you need to simplify, simplify the math, you shouldn't be working there, right? So that's baloney. Because they're busted. They're hardcore busted. Because and you say, why is this information out there? Well, the information is there because they have to design stuff to work as the world really is, not the way they try to tell us it is. But the sad reality is most of that, us are not willing, right? So, I mean, from, from an average person's perspective, even a believer, why would I go and ex- exert the effort to find out an uncomfortable truth? that is only going to make people laugh at me anyway. Like, 
white people. Well, think about this. Since when, since when did God ever call us to compromise truth so people won't persecute us? Amen. Never. We believe, let's look at what we already believe. We already believe God created the heavens and the earth in seven, in six days, seven day rest, right? They don't believe that. They mock us over that. We believe that Noah's flood was real and actually happened, flooded the whole earth. And of course, there's, there's plenty of geological evidence to prove that, right? Um, but they still deny. Um, the, they, they mock and laugh about Jonah being swallowed by the great fish. And yet not too long ago, a guy got swallowed by a big fish and survived and got spit out. I mean, so what I'm saying is they mock us. We believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, lived a sin, sinless life, died on the cross as an atoning sacrifice for our sins, rose from the dead three days later, ascended to heaven, and will come back again. They mock all that. They don't believe all that. So I look at Christians and go, since when are you worried about what the world thinks of you? You are called to stand up for the truth of God's word from Genesis to Revelation, from, from the creation to the second coming of Jesus. In fact, Paul told the Ephesian church, he said, I held back nothing. I kept back nothing from you. I, I taught you the whole counsel of God's word. As a minister, as a Christian, whether you're called to the ministry or you're just a lay Christian, you are supposed to, by God, tell the truth about everything from Genesis to Revelation. There is no excuse. And being ashamed of it, being worried about what people think, thinking you're crazy, laughing at you, mocking you. What? I mean, Paul went and preached at Athens and they mocked him. I mean, Paul would go into a synagogue and they would start yeah. coming against him. This little stuff of we've got to be like the world and agree with the world so the world will like us. That it is nonsense. Worked. We've never been. No, yeah. and it doesn't work. They, they've tried. It's called seeker yep. sensitive, uh, you know, seeker friendly or whatever you want to call it. The churches in America have adopted this philosophy back 30 years ago. And now what do we have? An empty yep. dead church for the most part, dead, secular. They're too afraid to offend people. Look, the gospel of Jesus Christ and any truth in the word has the potential to offend anyone. Even Jesus talking to his own disciples said, does this offend you, right? He goes, he even told him at one point, I have many things to say unto you, but you can't bear them. Yeah. Out. You can't handle it. Yeah. I mean, he was telling them, I got stuff I need to tell you. You can't handle it. Well, hey, I, I, I believe, you know, Jesus said this. He said, if you are ashamed of me and of my words, I will be ashamed of you before my father. And I'm just not ashamed. I don't believe we should be ashamed. I believe the, the creation of the earth and whether it's that truth or the truth about repentance from sin that most churches ignore or the truth about casting out demons or praying for the sick or the gift of tongues and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I believe whatever truth it is, you should be bold in your belief that God's word is true and men are liars. And I'm going to speak what God's word says. And I don't care if the whole world hates yeah. me for it. I mean, I, that, that right there with Christians just frustrates me to no end, as you can tell, because it's weakness. Yeah. It's, it's pure weakness. Let them laugh. Because see, here's the thing. I've had people mock and laugh at me about preaching what, what it, it may be different truths that they didn't understand or they didn't agree with. And then God, I planted the seed and then the Holy Spirit started watering that seed. And I've seen them repent and come back to me and say, I was wrong. God showed me. I started reading the Bible. I saw it's, it's true. What you told me was true. And it set me free. It's helped me immensely or brought me to Jesus or brought me out of addiction or whatever. So what I'm saying is we got to be as Christians. We should be people willing to take the heat to sow the seeds of truth and let God yeah. do the water yeah. and, and the dealing. Some are going to some are going to resist him and keep walking away. But many are going to go, you know what? It's true what that preacher told me. It's true what that Christian told me. I can't tell you how many people have said, I laughed at you. I mocked you. I, I thought you were crazy. And then God opened my eyes and, and showed me. And yeah. we're talking about atheists. Atheists, agnostics, new agers, people who are now into believing the ancient alien lie, the aliens created us and made us and that they're coming back and all that, and, you know, and I've seen people say, I, I, God brought me out of all that. And, and I used to hate you. I used to mock you. I used to ridicule you. So again, Christians just need to stop being little pansies. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> 
you, you so you brought up ancient aliens and and some of that other stuff i mean have you ever looked into nephilim um what is that giants yeah. oh yeah your your thoughts on on that stuff yeah yeah um i have entire messages on the the nephilim the the giants um genesis 6 is clear uh it says very plainly that the sons of god came into the daughters of men and giants were born into them. And he says back then. And then mm -hmm. after that, uh, I know there are people trying to say that the sons of God mean the sons of Seth, but that's ridiculous. Seth was the righteous seed restored and is a normal man. So a normal man with a normal woman is going to have normal humans. Um, the sons of God is a reference. You go back to the book of Job 38 and says the sons of God, he says, were there at creation. So what these angels, there's a class of angels called cherubim, seraphims. There's different classes of angels. One's called the sons of God angels. I think they're mostly like us. Uh, they don't look like flaming serpents and lights. They're, 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 they're the ones that God says, be careful to entertain angels because you, you know, you entertain them unaware. Well, a certain portion of them, you know, rebelled and followed Satan when he rebelled. And so those are the sons of God angels that rebelled that decided to have relations with human women and created a hybrid race called the nephilim the raphaim there were other names in the bible for them the amalekites the zamzumans the emanims uh, the anakims each of the children of anak so you had this mixture between the, these fallen angels and human women and you had these coming out so they've been around that's what the, the bones of these uh giants have been found all over the world um, I, in fact, the message I did back in like 2017 about it in detail, I pull up all the stuff from the Library of Congress showing articles in newspapers across the country and pictures from the late 1800s, early 1900s, where 15 foot, 10 foot, 11 foot, eight and a half foot um, skeletons have been found all over America and in different places of the world. And the Smithsonian, you know shows up and they disappear and hmm. we don't get to see them right but there's again there's pictures there's newspaper reports of people finding these digging them up you know getting ready to build a house start digging the foundation up oh, we got an 11 foot hmm. human here now some of them they would have different over the over time you'd have different anomalies like in the time by the time of david they talked about some of them had six fingers and six toes said one was like a lion-like man. He looked like a lion in the face. They've actually found that skeleton of a lion-like man. Um, we know Goliath was 11 feet tall. David fought, and he was um, so, and, and he had four other brothers that were as big as him. That's why David picked up five stones, because there was mm -hmm. five of them. And uh, so, so that's, that's, that's been part of our history and going on. And then I'll tell you this little secret. I led a high-level Satanist to Jesus back in 1987. This is pre-internet, so there's no looking up stuff on the internet. And we're doing a Bible study after she gave her life to Jesus, and we cast demons out of her and all kinds of wild stuff. But, you know, they tried to kill me, tried to kill her. It was crazy. But we started a Bible study with a group, and we started Genesis. And by the, we got to Genesis 6, and here's what she said. And you got to remember, generational Satanists, her father was over a four-state region. They're hardcore Satanists. We're talking about human sacrifice, the whole nine yards, rituals. She told me, when we got, we read that. She goes, you know, she said, these, these giants are under the earth right now. They're underground and they're going to come out in the tribulation period. Now, she told me this in 1987. Uh, fast forward, 1996, a guy named, um, oh, why am I losing his name? Uh, Phil Schneider. Phil Schneider, not a Christian. But genius guy, worked for the government, building underground bases like in Dulce, New Mexico and all over the place. Um, he was an expert at all kind of issues like different metals and alloys and stuff. He came out in 96, 97. You can look up his, his video uh, where he testified to going underground base in Dulce, New Mexico, going to the bottom floor, open the door, massive. He called them alien creatures, 8, 10, 11 feet tall he said freaked him out he he thinks they're aliens he says but you can't mention the name of jesus around them because one guy said jesus like in a cuss word type fashion and these things turned around and mm -hmm. killed this guy and so phil snyder came out telling that testimony and he was found strangled to death in his apartment in portland oregon not long after so 
I mean, I, I'm that guessing video. that's not going to be on YouTube. Like, I mean, where would? <laughs> yeah, it's on YouTube. You can still find. It. Just look. Just look up. It's it's out there. It may be on Rumble. I'm, okay. I've seen it. I've seen it recently. It's still Phil, out. It's still out there. Phil you Schneider probably find it. it might be on YouTube. It might not. <clears throat> yeah, Phil Schneider. Uh, just look at Phil Schneider, uh, deep underground military bases. Okay. You'll find it. Um, but what I'm saying is, is that what are we seeing? What happened in Miami the other day? Now, was that a hoax? We had you had 75 to 100 police cars show up. You had video, a little bit of video footage, but they said whatever was appearing there was interfering with electronics. Was that the beginning of the appearance of these Nephilim? Because see, this is what I believe. I believe Jesus said, as it was mm -hmm. in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So that what was going on in the days of Noah was these fallen angels and human women were, basically it was out and open in front of everybody. We've got these, these entities now that are half human, half fallen angel. And then, and then of course you take half, half human, like a, you take a full fallen angel and a human woman and you have a, Raphaim Nephilim, but you take a Raphaim Nephilim and another Raphaim Nephilim, and they have sexual relations, and then they create another branch of the gen, you know the genetic breakdown. So that's why you're going to have different looking things. I believe that's why we got started getting the elongated skulls, and that's why you get some of them that'll have the they'll be little like little gray aliens they call it, or the big tall ones with the big eyes. You just have you have mutation upon mutation with these things, just normal genetics as you go down the line. Um, but I think we're going to, I have said for years, I mean, many years, I'm on record saying they will appear in the last days and people are going to think they're aliens, but they're really these fallen angels, demons, and their offspring, which are these Nephilim beings that they've created over time underground mm -hmm. that kept hidden from us. There's going to be more and more manifestation. The day will come, you mark my words, they will walk out with some world leaders and say they're here to save us. Um, one of the top the Vatican and, you know, the Vatican, and the Roman Catholic Church, they are part of the agenda. They're part of the satanic cabal. Right. I'm talking about the people right. that are in the Roman Catholic, I'm talking about the hierarchy and the, but the high ups, the, particularly your Jesuits, Jesuit astronomer, Guy Cancel Magnet, who runs the uh, observatories. And he's the top MIT graduate scientist advisor to the Pope said the day will come when mankind will look to the aliens for their salvation and as their saviors. Uh, top professors at Vatican University, like Father uh, Tanzini uh, Giuseppe, Tanzini, he says, when these beings appear, when the aliens show up, we're going to have to reread the Gospels in a different way. We're going to look at things differently. And the whole lie coming down is going to come down is that the real creators of mankind are who seated us here with these aliens and that they gave us religion like Christianity to keep try to keep us moral and not destroy ourselves. But we've we've cast all that aside and we're about to destroy ourselves. So they're going to come and intervene and people are going to people are going to fall. This is what I believe is part of the final stage of what God calls in Second Thessalonians to the great and. Uh, final delusion that many will believe this lie, this delusion and be damned and go mm -hmm. to hell over it because they're going to choose these Nephilim alien beings as their salvation and mm -hmm. reject Jesus. It's very interesting. Yeah. I did a very, I did an in-depth, I did an in-depth series back just a few months ago called the, the great delusion. Mean, where, where can we, and, and where can we part, find your work? I mean, um, Fire and Grace Church, Fire and Grace School of Ministry, um, websites. Um, best place to go, best place. We have multiple websites, but the best website where all the information is and unedited videos that are just, you know, we have to edit videos now to put them on YouTube and stuff. But unedited videos, you just go to deanodle.org. Okay. And that's just my name, D-E-A-N-O-D-L-E.org. And then you can go to, uh, there's articles, there's a videos by topic or videos by year. Most people, best way to search is go to videos by topic. It's going to bring up a screen. It's going to go through like alien deception, end times, Bible prophecy, uh, biblical creation, cosmology, 
Um, so that that's the best place is, is deanodal.org. Okay. And that's where the bookstore is for all my books. And, uh, and yeah, Amazon, when the, when the debate with Pastor Greg Locke was announced, Amazon put up that my books, uh, out of stock. It's not out of stock because we have, um, we have print on demand from our book, book baby, our publisher. We set up print on demand, meaning that if Amazon says we need books, they tell our print, our uh, printer publisher, and they immediately print them and send them. So for over what, two months now, three months we're going into, um, it says if you go look up like like clay under the seal my book mm -hmm. about biblical creation it will say mm -hmm. out of stock so you cannot buy it on amazon because they are blocking it so you have to go to either bookbaby.com or deanodal.org and order it from us uh, international orders have to order from bookbaby.com but if you're within the u.s and canada well in the u.s okay. i should say not canada but in the u.s you can order from bookbaby or from well, us you know I I've unfortunately learned that pretty much any time all of the news media start repeating the same thing over and over again, it's it's probably not true. It's probably the opposite or or some other thing. And so it's not surprising yeah. to me to to start hearing a lot of this is new. Like I mean, I just heard the giant Akandahar story for the first time like two weeks ago, and it's I'm I'm like okay, so there's oh, yeah. There, there are unexplained things out there. It's such an honor and a privilege to speak with you and hear this from you. Cause I mean, like, I think there are a lot of people who are going to have to listen to this a, a few times and go to your website and order your books. And, um, do you have, you have a lot of videos and stuff on your website. Are there classes that people can take? I mean, is this, if well, we, the school of ministry, the, yeah, the school of ministry, fire grace school of ministry, um, you know, people can enroll. They have to, you know, they have to become an official student and all that, but I have made a good portion of some of the classes are public. So like there, if you go to, to denodal.org and you go to videos by topic, you're going to see one. It says FGSM classes. Well, those are classes that have, are, that I taught our, our, teach our students. They have to study, they test, they take tests and they have to write papers and all kinds of stuff or, but I've made some of them public so people get a little taste of uh, what the ministry school is in case they want to enroll. But you just you have to enroll and fill out an application and we have to approve it. And, 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 and we only let people enroll starting in September or well, August. They can enroll and then classes will start shortly thereafter. But I think August 1 is our deadline on on that. But there's people can check that out because actually the one where I teach on the pre-Adamic creation and the or and the history of the fallen angels is one of our classes, the Fire and Grace School of Ministry classes called uh, the, the history. Or I think it's the history or just fallen angels or whatever, but it's there. So it's for the public. Um, and then I have one a sermon I did talking about the Nephilim. I did one, the, uh, the Nephilim, Satan's uh, satanic uh, seed. And so there's a whole, that's where I go through all the, the Library of Congress stuff that I pulled off right off straight from the, mm -hmm. the government website about all that. So it's all there. You just have to navigate it a little bit. But if you want the full, like all the classes are not public. So you have to become a okay. student to go through all the classes. But I tell people all the time, I said, really, what I teach our students, I have taught over 36 years. And then over the last 15, once I founded Fire and Grace Church, we have 15 years of sermons on there. So I pretty much taught everything that's in yeah. the classes yeah. anyway. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's a lot of information there. We have, I think, I don't know, five, 600 videos. And then we also, we actually have audios because when we first started, we didn't, we didn't do videos. So we got audios going all the way okay. back to 2009. And then we used to do a two hour podcast called prophecy quake that I had to stop when I started running for governor. Cause my schedule is just too full. And, um, and so there's two hour uh, podcasts going through all kinds of stuff, yeah. like like a lot of this stuff. The the school um, of ministry that we have we did, we is, did for the school of ministry is that, that online only or is it in person? Okay, yeah, it's online only. We did with the first year, you know, we had students here that came and I taught the classes and we recorded them all, and then but. I knew it had to be online. We use the common online uh, service that most universities use for their online mm -hmm. classes called mm -hmm. Canvas. Uh, but we, we do a 
a Zoom call with all the students, wherever they are in the world, once a month. And then at graduation, they all come here and we have a big graduation ceremony for them uh, when they graduate. And you can complete it in one year if you want to work really hard and get it done. It's set up to be one year, but if you can't, okay. most people do it in two and years. Then just, but we've had students okay, from everywhere. Awesome. Yeah. My, my last question for you, just because you know, I've, I've taken way too much of your time, but I've I loved every moment of it. Um, and then I forgot the question, completely forgot the question. It's gone. It's gone. I was going to ask you something good. Well, let's say, Lord, you said you'd bring back all things to our remembrance. We pray, Lord, that you'd bring this back to David in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, what was that question? Um, I don't know. I don't know. As, as soon as as soon as we, it, it'll come. It'll, it'll, come, it'll come back. back. Yeah, my mind is just reeling because I, a lot of this stuff, you know, I've, I literally, I don't have anyone who I trust. All of my friends are like, oh yeah, David's the one who's a little out there, you know. And to have a genuine, real conversation with you is, it's gone a lot further than I expected. I thought we were going to talk about some flat earth stuff and some Bible stuff and just, you know, kind of leave it there. But, um, you, you know, a lot, you've, you've done a lot and it's exciting. It is, it's exciting for, for people. Well, you know, God, when God, when God called me, I'll, I'll say this, when God called me to the ministry, I always knew, and for a, especially for a pastor, your job is not, you know, that's why a lot of times, even though I'm kind of known in a, in a big way for the biblical creation and stuff, I'm also, you know, I start out mainly Bible prophecy stuff. So what I'm saying is, but our job as a, as a pastor is to give the truth about many topics. It's not, we're, we're supposed to cover everything. So you can't just be, you know, a one topic kind of minister or pastor because you will not be able to give your, your congregation a balanced diet. You know, uh, you can't just yeah. feed them cotton Come candy, you know, Come on. every day. There's got to be some meat and potatoes every it now. It came back. Yeah. It came back. Tell, oh. you, you, you mentioned Hallelujah. Skyfall, you, the, the Skyfall conference. <laughs> Can you just talk a little bit about that and how often that happens and yes. what happens there? Yeah, we, we uh, felt, you know, years ago, the Lord laid on my heart many years back 2011, 10, like we, that we would start having conferences. This is where a tiny church is like, you're going to have conferences on end time stuff. And, you know, so we did have one in 2012 was the first. It was mainly just end times prophecy stuff. And then we did it in 2013. And then we skipped a few years so because we just pray. We don't always say, well, we're just going to do it every year. We just pray and, and ask God's direction. But when the whole thing, I spoke at the first Flat Earth International Conference in Raleigh in 2017, there was a big war that broke out between basically the Christians and the New Agers and non-Christians that are in this thing. And I, I drew the line and put the sword in the middle and said, okay. So I I felt after that that God wanted me to do uh, uh a conference that would focus on primarily end time Bible prophecy and biblical creation and those two things together. So 2018 was the first one of those. It was awesome. We did one in 2019. We did one in 2020 during COVID, which was amazing that we were able to get a facility that allowed it. And we had, you know, I couldn't believe we had over 200 people show up in person during COVID. And then after 2020, that's when God had, led me to run for governor. So between the end of 2020 and 2022, by the end of 2022, I'd been, I, I ran 70,000 plus miles crisscrossing the state. I mean, I campaigned hard and I mean, I pre, I, I spoke at more places than any of the candidates, uh, but God wanted me to do that. Cause I, a lot of truth got out there. A lot of people know me now that didn't know me before. I gained a lot of respect from our leaders that now I can talk to about what's going to really come, what's going to really happen. So we didn't do 21, 20, and 22, but I felt like once the campaign was over that we were supposed to do 2023. So we had Skyfall 2023 and had six to 700 people show up. I mean, it was, it was amazing conference. It's, it's all online free. It's under the Skyfall bar. Uh, but I felt calling it Skyfall because it incorporates biblical cosmology term because Jesus said that 
you know, he's going to roll back the firmament and the, those hundred and hundred pound hailstones are going to come down and the stars are going to fall. And so I just felt that that incorporated both aspects of the things that we focus on. And man, did we have a, we always, I always try to get a diverse group of speakers to come. And I had Dr. Teresa Long, who's the whistleblower. She's the flight surgeon down in here in Fort Rucker, Alabama, but over the entire armed forces, all of our pilots have to go see her and run through her. She, she manages their health. And she said, we got to stop the vaccine, man. She's a, she's a amazing Christian woman, had her speak. Uh, you know, just people like that. We'll just bring in, you know, and even, and, and she, I don't even think she agrees with me or, no, or knows or understands the biblical cosmology, but I try to just bring in a diverse group of speakers as the Lord leads to cover. Like I covered AI this time and the mark of the beast. And um, then I did a, a, a thing on biblical cosmology 101, but it is, I don't know, we had five or six different speakers and we do, we do, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but Friday and Saturday are, are start at nine o'clock and it was just, mm -hmm. it's one after the other, like, you know, so yeah, it's a great time. And usually the evening services, we just have a worship time and love the Lord and pray for people. And, uh, we saw a lot of people get delivered and healed, um, by Jesus, you know, at, at the end, especially the skyfall, the Saturday night, this 2023 was amazing. Just God moved. So I know. I do believe we've been praying about it, that we're going to have Skyfall 2024, but we may have to change venues because some things have changed okay. where we were. We've met the last two times. So we're, we don't have the month yet okay. and we don't Is have the Is it usually in the yet. fall so, or? or but, well, we, we usually did them and started out doing them in October. And then this year we moved it to June, but probably we're going to be looking at, uh, Okay. August, okay. September time, probably is what, depending on the venue availability, we'll have Very to interesting. figure that well, out. We, we've talked a lot. And uh, is, is there anything else that you would just feel like, eh, maybe, maybe David's mom needs to hear this one. Any, anything else you want to zing us with? <laughs> I think what people need to do, I think people just need to sometimes shut off some things, shut off the media yeah. a little bit more and scrolling on Facebook and TikTok and everything else and take time to really pray, take time for real prayer and some fasting and, and reading yeah. and studying their Bibles because they are going to need to get yeah. God's word in them and God's truth in them to handle what is about to come upon this earth over the next few years. It's going, there's going to be a lot of dramatic changes and we're, we're heading into the last of the last days. And and I'm not a pre-tribulation rapture guy. I don't believe that at all. I believe that we're here through the whole thing and that there is a rapture and resurrection of it, but that's at the end at the second coming. And that's a whole yeah. can of worms. You have to walk people through the scriptures on that because they've been so indoctrinated that they're getting out of here before the bad stuff. But I'm going to tell you, you're not, and you better start preparing mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and, and even physically better start preparing for the big changes that are coming economically. Uh, there's going to be more war. The Lord showed me the United States will be invaded and, and we're going to see nuclear detonations go off in America and the economies they're going to be, they're going to destroy our economy to bring in the, the mark of the beast, which is going to be an implanted chip. I don't care what anybody says. I know people in places that have seen exactly what it is and I know it's coming uh, and it'll be mandated at some point, the mark of the beast. And, and, and if you take the mark of the beast, there's no coming back from that. That's one of the unpardonable sins. You, you read Revelation 14, it says, if you take the mark and worship his image and you receive that mark, that mark is an act of submission to them. And if you do it, it says that the smoke of your torment You'll be tormented with fire and brimstone and the smoke of your torment will go up day and night forever. I, I want to no have another back show just on that. So like, that to me is one of the, because, because, yeah, we, that, that's another, that's a whole, yeah, yeah detailed topic. Yeah, I've, there. I've a, yeah, I have, go ahead. I, have I was going to say, okay. I have a spot. <laughs> I, I think, I think a lot of times, you know, people want to debate scripture as a, it's an either or. You know, I mean, you, you mentioned once saved, always saved. I like how you clarified that at the very beginning of our discussion, how you clarified that meaning like get saved, pray, pray a prayer and then go live however you want. 
I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. A true like five point Calvinist would say, no, I love, I love Jesus because he redeemed me and I never could have, you know, and, and they can make a point, but the Armenian side of the argument is also true. I, I think like it, it's a both and it's not an either or. And I think a lot of times. Well, I tell, well, I, yeah, I tell people, you know, Bible says we're saved mm-hmm. by grace through faith, right? Grace is God's part. We can't do any of that. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. God has to convict us. He has to draw us. He has to open our eyes. The mm-hmm. faith part, though, is our part. And faith is not just saying, I believe. Faith has actions to it. That's what James right. said. Faith without works is dead, being alone. I mean, there must be corresponding actions. Well, corresponding actions of your faith that Jesus is Lord and that he hates sin. And he said, yeah, I came to call sinners to repentance. Then the act of faith is when we repent and we turn from our sins, living in it habitually, uh, sins that are unto death. And so real repentance. So I agree with the side that says, hey, salvation, God does this. part. Yeah, he does. But where Calvinists get it wrong is they basically go, we don't have free will and it's just automatic. And it's not. God said he's given us a free will. We choose. But we choose because he's tugged on our hearts. But we can resist. That's why That's why Stephen said, you know, you told the Pharisees, you resist yeah. the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. That's why Paul yeah. said, quench not the Spirit. You can quench and resist the Holy Spirit. So it's it's God's not going to force us. I tell people all the time, I said, you're going to end up in the place of the one you followed. It's that yeah. simple. And And saying you have a mental assent to something, you believe something, but you live another way. No. And a lot of people take grace and turn it into a license to sin. That's one of the first book I wrote as a a young pastor was entitled Grace Abuse, uh, one of the greatest hindrances to revival. And on the back, the top heading on the back cover says grace is not a license to sin. And if we understand that, that God hasn't given us a license to sin and he wants us to live holy lives, not meaning we will never sin. But, man, I'm, you know, I've been married uh, over, just over 15 years, we're working on 16 years. I hadn't committed adultery on my wife. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We don't have to go live in right. sins that are unto death. And so that's that's the way I define it. It's, it's a difference between a Christian struggling, maybe sinning and getting back up and dealing with it versus a, a Christian that thinks, well, because I'm covered by God's grace or I'm his elect, I can, yeah. there's nothing I can do. I can just, I can be a homosexual. I can be a drunkard. I can be a fornicator. I can be an adulterer as a believer and still go to heaven when you die. Yeah. And that is a lie. Yeah. That is a deception. Well, I mean, you know, Paul, Paul says that clearly for yeah. Corinthians six, that's what, that's what you were. Like some of you were, were thieves and names out this litany of, of sins. Right. And that's what you were. And, and where Christians miss it, we're, we're, we're out there, we're making converts instead of disciples. And I'm speaking, you know, globally, the body of Christ, we're, we're not making disciples, we're making converts. And then, people are not maturing in their faith. They're not leaving their sin behind. And then they have this false sense of security that they're going to heaven someday because they asked Jesus into their heart. And the, the scripture just does not say that at all. So thank you. I agree, man. hundred uh, percent. And, and really, let me tell you what a lot of church growth is in, in church. Oh, yeah. It's Absolutely. transfer growth. They're just, they're just getting people to come because of the, the latest new thing on the block. And they got, maybe they got the more fancy coffee shop and donut bar and people will go, Oh, I'm going to go over here to or this. It's a fresh I mean, teaching. If, if they're not preaching, yeah. If they're not preaching the, the gospel that calls for repentance from sin and obedience, a, an obedient walk with Jesus and a real intimate, a born again experience and a real walk with Jesus. If they're not doing that, they have failed. They have failed their people and they're going to give an account for it because it's, it's a, it's a miserable failure of yeah. leading people astray and just giving, I call it the given the, the yes. inoculation of Christianity. It's like they give you enough of it to make you allergic or, or immune yeah. to the real thing, to the rest of it. And people sit in, in these dead seeker sensitive, lukewarm churches all day long thinking, yeah, I'm saved because I believe this. And they've never truly repented. They've never really dealt with their sin. They've never been transformed. They've never, a lot of them have never had a true born again experience with Jesus. And, and and so somebody like us comes along and starts talking about real Christianity and walking with the Lord. And they're just like, yeah, yeah. you're, we don't have to be so extreme, man. No, no. 
You know, I love what Leonard Ravenhill used to say. The church is, it has become so subnormal that anybody that becomes normal Christianity, like Bible mm -hmm. Christianity, mm -hmm. is weird and strange and like mm -hmm. the, the outcast. But uh, no, I'm, I'm, I've told people all the time, I will not go to, I will not go to judgment day, stand before God and have your blood on my hands. I'm going to tell you the truth. If it makes you mad, makes you cuss, makes you cry, makes you upset. I don't care. I'm going to tell you how it is. And they, and a lot of people try to say, oh, well, if you teach repentance that you have to turn from sin and follow Jesus, you're teaching work salvation. I said, let me ask something. If you're an adulterer, right? You got to have two phones. You're trying to hide it from your wife. You're trying to schedule hotel rooms. And all right. But when you repent, it means you quit doing that. So that's why Paul called adultery a work of the flesh, because you're working. You're working to make that happen. But if you repent, you're ceasing from that work. You're just stopping. How is stopping a work working? Yeah. yeah. You get what I'm saying? I ceased from a work of sin, a work of the flesh, a habitual work. And I said, that's all it is. You know, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve didn't earn where they were. They were new creatures in God. They were sinless. They had, they, they, they didn't earn a place in the garden. It was all given them by God's mercy and grace. They had no part in earning any of where he placed them and the condition of sinlessness that he put them in. But he did put the knowledge of the tree and evil and said, here's what you gotta do. Just don't walk over there, pick that, bite it, chew it, swallow it. Don't go, just leave that alone. So it, it wasn't a work, it was, but it was a condition. You can't, you take that, you disobey me in this area, death comes in. And so they went and ate it. So I tell people, not is, is it, would you define not eating a work or eating a work? <laughs> it's like, once you understand that they didn't earn it, but they had to keep it by walking in obedience to God by not doing mm -hmm. certain things habitually. Mm -hmm. Not, God doesn't say you, you earn your salvation by by feeding the poor or yeah. visiting people in prison. You know what I'm saying? It's We don't believe, even Armenian type people like me that believe you have to obey and walk with God. I don't believe you earn it by any type of good deeds or good works. But God does say there's things yeah. I want you to stay away from to, that, to never become a habitual lifestyle of sin in your life. And all you have to do mm -hmm. is not do them. Mm -hmm. That's not no, working. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's not and, and so much of Christianity has been so weak that it's normal. Like, I mean, you could go to a lot of churches, and it, I'm I'm not saying this to knock any church, um, but just to wake up, wake us up to the idea that we're not supposed to be normal. You know, I mean, Jesus said, "Abide in Him," right? To to live, to dwell. To, in him, we have our, our being. It's, we exist in him. And then we could ask whatever we want, and it would be done for us. The can you imagine, can you imagine, okay, this thing, people don't look at Jesus how he really is. Can you imagine Jesus walking into a church, but not looking like Jesus, looking like the pastor, and walking up there and saying, you've made this place a den of thieves and throwing the coffee shop out the door and the bookstore and the donut shop and saying, if you guys don't repent, you're going to perish. You want to know what they would do to him? If he took a whip and started throwing tables over and drove some people out, we forget who he is. We forget, you know, that he means what he says and that this, this is not a game we're playing. And, and it's, and, and and again, don't get me wrong. I know there's good churches out there and there's there's pastors out there that maybe they're not a, a aware or awake to some of these truths we talked about today, but they're still trying to feed their flock and, and help people get strong. And, you know, what I'm, so I'm not, I'm, I don't want anybody to think I'm against the rest of the church world. I know there's good pastors and good churches out there. And it, just because they may not know everything that we know or into, they're still sincere and they're still helping people. But again, there's those that have sold out for for money and for numbers and for church growth, and they they're afraid to say certain things, teach certain things, and they just water it down. Yeah. That's what's yeah. troubling. Um, and and it's I just want to make sure I get that. Well, it's Jesus, not, we know it's not Jesus, 
doing that. Said he is it's the truth, right. right? I mean, I think in Revelation it says his name is maybe on on his on his leg, grace and truth. So to not pursue the truth is to not pursue him. That's the the way I look at it. Well, and I'll say this: Christians, the reason that Christians get stunted in their growth, or maybe a church, the reason we have denominations is simple: God revealed a truth to them, say the, the truth of salvation and repentance, and they were born again, and they and and like Charles Wesley talked about, his heart was finally strangely warm. You know, he tried to serve the Lord for years without being born again, and it was a miserable failure. And then he gets saved; he truly gets born again and and receives Jesus by faith, and he's transformed. You know. And, you know, again, he, he begins to just turn the world upside down after that. Um, and I, goodness, I kind of thought, well, I kind of lost my track. Where were we just, going? What were you just, just talking say? about pursuing truth? What was that the question? Pursuing truth is pursuing Jesus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's what I said. Well, yeah, I was saying about denominations. It's like they get a truth and then they kind of like, well, God's saying, okay, now we get, let's go to this one and let's go to this truth in the Bible. Let's say the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit or, uh, true repentance or evangelism or creation or whatever you want to say. Let's go here and learn this so we can give an answer to every man of the reason, the hope that is in us, right? And a church will say, well, we're good. We're satisfied where we are. God moved here. So we don't really need all this other stuff. And then you have a group of people come along and say, God moves and shows them this stuff. And they start using it to help people get saved and set them free and stuff. And they go, well, hey, we we can't operate within this framework because they don't want to they don't want to go where we're going. So then you got another denomination, you know, and that's happened over years. And, but now we're at a point where, where God said, you know, he warned us in the last days, many would fall away. Many would turn and there would be a lukewarm church Yeah, we're and there. we're there. You know, it's just a lot have, a lot have fallen away from truth and a lot have, are, are just saying, I'm not pursuing any further. So I agree with you. If you, if you're walking with Jesus in a real relationship with him and you, you're full of the Holy spirit, the Bible, he's Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is going to lead you and guide you all truth. into all, all truth. truth. I mean, you don't know it all right now. Yeah. You gotta keep, you gotta keep being allowing yourself to be led by him into all truth. So you should be growing and learning new things and teaching and preaching things that are in the word, not not necessarily new yeah. things, but things that are in the Bible, but maybe things you have yeah. ignored or didn't see or whatever. And because they have their purpose. The things God put in his word, all of them have a purpose. And that's why he, Paul said to Timothy, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable mm -hmm. for doctrine. Mm -hmm. So he's telling everything in yeah. there is profitable. It has a reason for it. He didn't well, waste his time. I, 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 uh, I think, I think so it would serve us all you. well to be humble, right? Jesus says that the scripture says that you can't build a skyscraper on a foundation for a one story home. You just, you just can't do it. And the reason I think a lot of people, we don't progress in our understanding is because we're, we're built on cracked foundations. We're on crumbling foundations on, on untruths. There, there are things, whether it's denominationalism, whether it's, you know, something we were taught, something we heard that wasn't even said, you know, we all have misunderstandings and our pursuit should be to overcome those, to listen to things that make us mad a little bit so that we're coming into contact with the truth and we're, we're examining ourselves. We're testing ourselves, right? I mean, how do you test yourself if you only listen to the people who make you feel good? Right. Exactly. Yeah. You need some, look, the, 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 one of the key components of a true prophet, a true man and woman of God is that they make you uncomfortable. Especially I actually, I've been a little uncomfortable today. You know, I, I, <laughs> just a little. <laughs> I mean, the, the the old preachers, the old preachers used to say this: "My job is to comfort the afflicted mm. and afflict the comfortable." Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. If you're comfortable in 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 where you are, not really desiring to grow and to learn and to expand what you what you know and understand about God and everything, you you really have limited yourself. And you're right. You just put yourself in these little echo chambers of people telling you what you want to hear. And, you know, then there comes a John the Baptist standing out there yeah. going, hey, yeah. this whole system yeah. over here is dead. There, there, there are snakes and vipers, whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. And 
you know, boy, he's looked at as what, you know, but we, we all often need to be shaken out of comfort zones. We get in. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a good thing. It is good. It is, it is absolutely a good thing. And more and more people are waking up and uh, it's beautiful to watch. I've so enjoyed this today, Dean Odell. So it's, Oh, it's been great, dot man. Thank you. Org. I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you. I've done a lot of interviews, and it's not all the time that I feel like the anointing of the Holy Spirit, like talking with somebody. And I could many times just as we talk back and forth today, I could just feel like little waves of Him coming through. And I'm like, wow, the Lord is really, um, He's really on this. So, brother, I appreciate you. Appreciate you having me, and I know God's going to use you and what you're doing in, in a mighty way because He His Amen. His anointing I, is on. So. I agree, and um, I'm I'm excited about the great and terrible day of the Lord that's coming. It's it's going to be it's going to be very interesting to to see. But but people think think about the great and terrible day of the Lord. Why is it great? Why is it terrible? It's it's not terrible for everybody, right? It's not great for everybody, and um, right. just such right. an honor. I mean. I've got a lot of homework to do, but I, I want to talk with you again. And I've genuinely, genuinely oh, enjoyed absolutely. this. Absolutely. And and look, say this, anytime you want to call and talk, if uh, you know, if I'm free and, or if you miss me, I'll call you back. But if you got questions or you want me to direct you to maybe a certain sermon about a certain topic or whatever, just let me know. Okay. I'll, I'll, I, I've, I'll get back with you. I think, I think we, we, we had a, we had a mix up last week with our initial meeting. Cause I guess my emails were going to spam. Um, so, uh, I, I will yep. shoot you yep. another email and, uh, you know, that way you have my contact info and I, I will, I'll reach out. I will. All right. Sounds God great, brother. You. Sounds great, man. Enjoyed it. God bless you.